In this video, we're going to examine the uh, failure mode of buckling. Now, buckling can occur whenever you have a structure that's under compressive axial forces, and that compressive axial force can actually cause the, um, the structure to deform, not in the uh, axial direction, but lateral to that. And so when that happens, such that the uh, lateral deflection is, um, uh, is excessive so that the uh, uh, structure can't take any more loading, then we call that buckling. Uh, a lot of structures can buckle, uh, plates, shells, uh, framework of structural members, but we're going to uh, look at simply a, a axial loaded column and uh, try to learn something about buckling here. So you know if you take uh, a slender member like a, a drinking straw, a plastic ruler, that you can pull on it pretty hard without failing it, but if you try to compress it, try to push the ends of it together, then uh, it will bend and you can't really put any increased force on it at a relatively small amount of force, and that's buckling. So we're going to take a look at an analogy here before we try to uh, derive the buckling equation for a column. Let's, uh, instead of a column, let's use two rigid links that are joined together uh, by a, a pin joint in the middle. And it's also pinned at the top and the bottom as well. So at the top and the bottom, it cannot uh, move laterally. And we're going to put the uh, force P, uh, again, an axial force in compression here. So if we look at this structure the way it is right there, we'd say, yeah, it's in equilibrium. Um, that force P will be reacted by a force, uh, an upward force P down at the bottom. There's no side loads. And so we would say that it's in equilibrium. However, we can see that any slight misalignment would create a would create a moment that would cause this to not be in equilibrium. So because of that, we say that this structure is unstable. It is in equilibrium, but any slight disturbance would uh, would cause that to go out of equilibrium and would cause the uh, structure to collapse. Now, if we put a attach a spring to it, then uh, we can uh, have a, a stable structure here. Um, the force in the spring, of course, would be its spring constant times the uh, displacement of that center joint. And we can use statics to analyze this. We don't really need to uh, uh, use mechanics and materials quite yet. Now, if uh, again, if the spring was, was not there, this would be in equilibrium. But uh, what the spring does is for any slight disturbance, the uh, spring force can restore this to equilibrium. So if I push it a little bit to the right, the spring will push back to the left to keep it in equilibrium. And if I pull that joint over to the left a little bit, I'll put the spring in tension, and it will want to pull it back toward the center again. Now, what if that joint is displaced? You know, can this be in equilibrium? And to do that, we're going to take a look at the uh, uh, upper member here, draw a free body diagram. We've got the applied force P. We've got a uh, pin force uh, sideways uh, R here. And we have an axial force within the member. Now, this is a two force member, so we know that, the, uh, that there is no bending moment here, that the, axial, uh, the force in the member has to be along the uh, axis of the member. And so, um, by taking the sum of the forces in the y direction, we have a, uh, an equation for that uh, axial force in the member n as a, fu a function of the applied load p and the uh, angle of displacement theta. Now moving down to the center joint, uh, it's symmetric top to bottom, so we see that the, the force n is going to be the same in both of the members. And f here is the uh, spring force. So by taking the sum of the forces in the x direction, we have this equation. We know from uh, the previous slide that n is related to p and theta. And the spring force f uh, is related to the spring stiffness k and the deformation of the center joint, which can be related to the length and to the angle theta. And so working through that, do a little bit of uh, trigonometry here. And we come up with the uh, simple solution that the applied load P is equal to KL over 4. Now notice uh, this solution is good for any value of theta. So what we found is that uh, if we have a value of P that can cause this to be in equilibrium, say at, at theta equals 10 degrees, 
we can move this over to theta equals 20 or 30 degrees without changing the value of p. So we call this uh, axial force the critical load, uh, hence the uh, CR as the subscript. And if we have an axial force less than this, then the spring force is going to be able to hold things in place. We call that stable equilibrium. If we exceed um, P critical, then the spring is no longer able to uh, hold things in place, and so even a tiny disturbance will cause this to uh, go out of equilibrium, and so we, see, we call the structure then as an unstable equilibrium. Now let's put some numbers on this. We'll let L equals 16 inches and K equals 20 pounds per inch for the spring constant. And quick calculation gives us P critical of 80 pounds. And now we're going to do a SOLIDWORKS motion simulation to see if we can uh, see what that load actually means. So in this simulation, we're going to let the axial force start at zero and increase by 10 pounds every second. So we set this up to be a 10 second uh, uh, simulation going from zero to 100 pounds with this axial force. Now at the same time, I'm going to put a very small side load, only a tenth of a pound, so a negligible load but enough to cause a disturbance. If we don't put that on at all, then again, because everything's in perfect alignment, we could put the axial force on there and we would, uh, we would never see any um, uh, it go out of equilibrium. But a very small side load, we'll see what the effect is on that. So let me switch over. Oops, a little too far. Okay, so here's our simulation. And so if you watch the, uh, the bar down here at the bottom, uh, along, you'll see we're at 2 seconds now, which is 20 pounds, now 30 pounds of the uh, axial force. Again, the side force is a tenth of a pound. So we're approaching 50 pounds. And uh, again, our prediction is up until 80 pounds, the spring force is enough to keep it in equilibrium. Now we're at about 75, approaching 80 pounds. And yeah, pretty much right when we get to 80 pounds, you can see what the effect was there. So as long as the axial force was less than 80 pounds, the spring could push the joint back into alignment. But once we got uh, reached 80 pounds, the spring force was no longer enough. So we want to apply that now to a, a continuous column. And so instead of, the, uh, instead of the spring that keeps things in alignment or that pushes things back into, uh, uh, into uh, equilibrium, it's going to be the bending stiffness of the column itself. And so let's take a look at a, a free body diagram here. Um, again, uh, uh, the side displacement would be V. And so in this case, when we look at the free body diagram of the uh, lower half of the member, you can see because of the displacement here that we end up with a moment. And that moment is equal to P times V. Now using our uh, standard uh, beam uh, equations here, we're assuming that X is along the length and that Y would be uh, to the left in this case. And so this deformation, the way I've drawn it here, would be negative V. And so that gives me the equation m plus pv is equal to zero. But in uh, bending theory, we see that the moment is equal to the bending stiffness ei times the second derivative of displacement with respect to x. And plugging that in, we have now a differential equation eiv double prime plus pv is equal to zero. And that can be solved uh, pretty easily if we let uh, the uh, uh, variable alpha be the square root of p over ei, then we have v double prime plus alpha squared v is equal to zero. And the solution for that um, involves both cosine and sine of alpha x. And of course, two, uh, two constants that depend on the initial conditions. So we know that at the bottom, at x equals zero, the displacement is equal to zero. That leads to the to, uh, the first constant being equal to zero. We also know at the upper end v is equal to zero. Now there's three possibilities that can cause v to equal to zero. One is if c1 is equal to zero or if alpha is equal to zero 
or if the sine of alpha L is equal to zero. Any three of those, any one of those would cause the displacement at the upper end to be equal to zero. But in the first case, if C1 is equal to zero and C2 is equal to zero, that says there's no side displacement. So we have the, the case where uh, if the uh, column is straight up and down, it's not displaced to the side, then we know we're in equilibrium. Well, that's, that's kind of a trivial result for us. Also, if alpha equals zero, remember the definition of alpha is the square root of p over ei, that means that p is equal to zero. Okay, well, again, if there's no axial force, then certainly we're in equilibrium. The third uh, is the um, third possibility is the one that we're interested in here, which is that the sine of alpha l is equal to zero. Well, there's uh, several values of alpha l, or an infinite number of alpha l's that will cause that to be true. The lowest non-zero value uh, uh, corresponds to alpha l being equal to pi. And so again, putting in our definition for alpha, squaring both sides, and solving for p, we find that the buckling load of a column, p critical, is pi squared ei divided by l squared. Now this, of course, is just for pinned ends. If we um, have other kind of end conditions, then we can uh, uh, do a similar kind of thing, although the math gets a little bit more difficult, and we can simply um, we come up with a similar result. and um, this value of k then is what's called the end effects factor. And so again, our baseline was pinned pinned, and for that k is equal to one. You can see if we fix it on one end, we make it uh, we make it harder to buckle is, is one way of looking at it. And so the k value, uh, which remember is in the denominator here, uh, makes the p critical value go higher. If both ends are fixed, that is both uh, ends are constrained against rotation as well as translation, then the k value goes higher yet. And the, uh, uh, the highest value of k, which corresponds to the lowest uh, value of buckling uh, load, would come if uh, the beam, excuse me, the column is fixed at its base and free to uh, move about uh, and rotate at the top. So one more thing about the critical load there is that remember we ended up with something involving the bending stiffness EI. Remember that uh, always use the lowest value of I, that is the least stiff axis when you're doing an analysis. So in this example uh, the beam may be designed to bend about um, its strong axis but when we put a load on it, compressive load, we don't really, unless we brace it some way, we don't have control over which way it's going to uh, going to buckle, so we use the uh, value of the least stiff axis.